Noah's Ark is one of the few Bible stories most people recognize. Experts and archaeologists have been searching for the remnants of this intriguing wooden building for decades. Because of the Ark's significance in the Bible and, in general, Christians are rejoicing in the latest discovery of the Ark. This is not merely a mundane tale. Rather, it is an account of the apparent and unwavering efforts of scientific inquiry, which is only now starting to bear fruit and solve the age-old enigmas that allude to spiritual realities and awe. What scientists have discovered, where is it now? Let's join in the journey in today's video to explore the truth. Noah's Ark is among the best-known and most captivating of all Old Testament stories. After creating humans, God became so displeased with them that He struck earth with an all-encompassing flood to wipe them out, with one noteworthy, the biblical patriarch and his family, accompanied by the pairs of each of the planet's animals, who rode out the deluge in an enormous wooden vessel. For people who accept the religious text as a historically accurate account of actual events, the hunt for archaeological evidence of the Ark is equally captivating, inspiring some intrepid faithful to comb the slopes of Armenia's Mount Ararat and beyond for traces of the wooden vessel. Apparently first seen by a local Kurdish farmer following an earthquake in May 1948, the world's attention was drawn to this streamlined boat shape by the publication of an aerial photograph taken by a Turkish Air Force pilot in Australian PIX magazine on July 9, 1960, and American Life magazine on September 5, 1960. Another earthquake in December 1978 is said to have enhanced the relief between the boat-shaped formation and the surrounding terrain, although erosion has since been actively modifying it. However, this particular boat shape is far from unique. The Turkish Air Force released another photograph several years ago showing three similar boat shapes in the mud flow material on the foot slopes of nearby Lesser Mount Ararat. So in reality, if it wasn't for the fact that this particular boat shape is the approximate length of the biblical Noah's Ark, then little attention would have been paid to it, even though it lies within the region the Bible describes as the mountains of Ararat. In 1876, British attorney and politician James Bryce climbed Mount Ararat, where biblical accounts say the ark came to rest, and claimed a piece of wood that suits all the requirements of the case, was in fact a piece of the vessel. More modern ark discoveries take place on a regular basis. From an optometrist's report, he'd seen it in a rock formation above the mountain in the 1940s, to a claim evangelical pastors had found petrified wood on the peak in the early 2000s. Claims about this boat shape were previously discussed in Creation 12, September 1990. The site is properly known as the Durupinar site, named after the Turkish army captain who first saw the boat shape on the aerial photograph and who was involved in the first expedition in 1960. Some more recently have called it the Akiyaila site, after the region in which it is located. The site has been vigorously promoted by self-styled archaeologist and explorer Ron Wyatt since 1977, when he first visited Turkey and began investigations. Over the years, particularly in the mid-1980s, Wyatt repeatedly tried to interest other people in the site, such as former U.S. astronaut Colonel James Irwin, and ICR scientist Dr. John Morris. Neither of these men was convinced after on-site inspections. In 1985, Wyatt was joined by former Merchant Marine officer David Fassold and geophysicist Dr. John Baumgardner. Both men have since parted company with Wyatt, Fassold disagreeing with him over details, and Baumgardner, while originally being cautiously enthusiastic, is now adamant the site does not contain Noah's Ark. Australian doctor Alan Roberts first visited the site in 1990 and thereafter initiated the organization Ark Search in order to raise funds to work with Wyatt on an archaeological dig. Their efforts came to world media attention when they were kidnapped 
and held captive by Kurdish guerrillas for three weeks in September 1991. Both Wyatt and Roberts continued to actively promote the site as the probable remains of Noah's Ark. In recent years, Wyatt was interviewed on a number of U.S. television programs, the footage of which he combined with his team's on-site footage to make a video that has been widely marketed among many Christians, who have thus become excited about the possibility that Noah's Ark has supposedly been found. Meanwhile, during the first half of 1992, Dr. Alan Roberts embarked on a systematic Australia-wide lecture tour, and his Ark Search organization produced a booklet summarizing their evidence and marketed a video of his public lecture. With this brief background, we now evaluate the evidence claim by claim and respond. Unfortunately, not one of these seemingly convincing claims stands up. Recently, a breaking news that archaeologists in Turkey have discovered what they believe to be ruins of a Noah's Ark-like vessel after excavating a geological site. The Mount Ararat and Noah's Ark research team comprises three Turkish and American universities. The team extracted aged rock and soil samples from a geological formation in Turkey, which they believe contained the ruins of the vessel. Their findings also determined that clay materials, marine materials, and seafood were present in the area between 5,500 and 3,000 B.C., according to the Turkish newspaper Hurriyet. The Durupinar Formation lies in the Dogobayazit district of Agri, located less than two miles from the Iran-Turkey border. It is a 538-foot geographic feature made of limonite, believed by some locals to be the remnants of Noah's Ark. According to legend, Noah loaded two of every animal onto a 150-meter-long ark to save them from apocalyptic flooding that drowned the earth. In the book of Genesis, it was the mountains of Ararat in what is now eastern Turkey where Noah's ark came to rest after the flood. The mountain stands at 16,500 feet and is carved out like an ark. According to the first findings obtained from the studies, there have been human activities in the region since the Chalcolithic period, between the years 5,500 and 3,000 B.C. It is known that the flood of Prophet Noah went back 5,000 years ago. In terms of dating, it is stated that there was life in this region as well. This was revealed in the laboratory results. It is not possible to say that the ship is here with the dating. We need to work for a long time to reveal this. Human activity, however, does not prove a biblical account. The Durupinar Formation has been put forth as a potential ark resting place for many years and has received extensive attention from those hoping to find Noah's Ark. Despite the hype, archaeologists have consistently reaffirmed over the years that the formation is natural, not the result of a petrified shipwreck, and that there is no geologic record of a global flood like the one described in religious texts. Some believe that a more local flood may have been possible, but that is also debated. The team of researchers placed a renewed focus on the region by exploring varying geological areas, including the Durupinar Formation, which is made of limonite that bears resemblance to a ship like Noah's Ark. Further exploration led the team to take the rock and soil samples from the country's highest peaks for laboratory analysis. While dozens of researchers and individuals have claimed to have located the Ark, no one has ever been able to produce definitive evidence. The holy texts of three religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, have all made references to Noah's Ark. Where is Noah's Ark? There have been many claims over the years that explorers have found the remains of Noah's Ark. While this great ship really did exist thousands of years ago, what can we say about it today? One challenge in finding the Ark is the enormous size of the area to search. While many people believe the Ark landed on present Mount Ararat, the Bible actually states that it landed on the mountains of Ararat in General 8, 4. 
IG's geologist Dr. Andrew Snelling thinks it unlikely that the Ark landed on Mount Ararat because of the geologic nature of that mountain. In fact, Mount Ararat was formed as a result of a volcano. We can't be sure of whether there was already a mountain there prior to the volcanic eruptions, but from all our knowledge of volcanoes and of the eruptions that have been witnessed, it would have to be concluded that it is likely there were no mountains or hills there previously. Indications are that the lavas making up the Mount Ararat volcano today is of considerable thickness, much higher and thicker than the Ark itself. This would mean that the Ark should have landed at the place currently known as Mount Ararat. On day 150 of the flood, it would eventually have been buried under thousands of feet of hot, burning lavas. Certainly, if the remains of Noah's Ark were found, it would be the greatest archaeological discovery in history. So now, what if the remains of the Ark were found? Would it result in mass conversions? It would certainly spark tremendous interest and be headline news. But I believe we need to put all this in perspective, and I think it will be helpful to understand a conversation in Luke 16 about a rich man, Abraham and Lazarus. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father Abraham, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rises from the dead. The bolded words are a reminder that we, like the rich man's brothers, have God's word. If people are not prepared to believe God's word, they won't be persuaded even if a dead person comes back to warn them. In Matthew 28, we read that the chief priests had money given to the soldiers so they would report the body of Jesus was stolen instead. Jesus had obviously risen from the dead, and they refused to believe. Even though finding Noah's Ark would be another phenomenal confirmation of the truth of Scripture, and we would love to see that happen, we already have overwhelming confirmation of the reality of the Ark and a global flood. That includes the massive fossil record in the ground, flood accounts that abound in dozens of cultures around the world, and other evidence. Noah's Ark was a sign to the pre-flood world that God judges sin, and that in His grace He provides a way of escape from that judgment. All through the Scriptures, God gave the Israelites sign after sign, and they still rejected His Word. The discovery of Noah's Ark would be another sign to this world that God's Word is true. But I believe we could also say something like this. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if Noah's Ark is found. The story of Noah's Ark is one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. It is found in the book of Genesis and tells the story of how God instructed Noah to build an ark and save two of each animal from the great flood. The ark would act as a refuge for the animals and Noah and his family while God cleansed the earth. After forty days the water began to recede, and the ark came to a stop on the mountains of Ararat. Noah released a dove, which returned with an olive leaf, signifying that the waters had decreased. Noah and his family then left the ark, taking the animals with them, and God put a rainbow in the sky as a sign of his promise to never again send a flood to destroy the earth. The story of Noah's ark is an essential reminder of God's faithfulness and mercy, and it continues to be a source of hope and comfort for people around the world. The Bible story of Noah's ark is filled with faith, perseverance, and promise. Noah was a man who found great favor in God's eyes. The entire population of mankind had become evil and wicked, and God decided to bring a flood to the earth to destroy everyone but Noah and his family. God told Noah to prepare an ark big enough to hold one male and one female from every kind of animal and creature. This is why many pictures depicting Noah's ark show animals coming two by two. 
When it started raining, Noah brought his wife and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, onto the ark. It rained for forty days and forty nights. After coming to rest on a mountain, Noah sent out a dove to find dry land, but it returned. Seven days later, he sent out another dove, and it returned with an olive leaf, signaling that it was safe to go on to land. God promised never to destroy the earth with a flood again, and placed a rainbow in the sky as a sign of his promise. Noah is instructed to build an ark. Noah is warned of the flood and given directions for building the ark. God told Noah his purpose was to destroy the wicked world by water. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. It is with all believers, enabling them to understand and apply the declarations and warnings of the written word. God chose to do it by a flood of waters, which should drown the world. As He chooses the rod with which He corrects His children, so He chooses the sword with which He cuts off His enemies. God established His covenant with Noah. This is the first place in the Bible where the word covenant is found. It seems to mean the covenant of providence that the course of nature shall be continued to the end of time. The covenant of grace that God would be a God to Noah and that out of his seed God would take to himself a people. God directed Noah to make an ark. This ark was like the hulk of a ship fitted to float upon the waters. It was very large half the size of St. Paul's Cathedral, and would hold more than 18 of the largest ships now used. God could have secured Noah without putting him to any care or pains or trouble, but employed him in making that which was to be the means to preserve him for the trial of his faith and obedience. Both the providence of God and the grace of God own and crown the obedient and diligent. God gave Noah particular orders on how to make the ark, which could not therefore but be well fitted for the purpose. God promised Noah that he and his family should be kept alive in the ark. What we do in obedience to God, we and our families are likely to have the benefit of. The piety of parents inspires their children to do good in this life and furthers them in the way to eternal life if they improve it. Noah's faith triumphed over all corrupt reasonings, to rear so large a building, such a one as he never saw, and to provide food for the living creatures, would require from him a great deal of care and labor and expense. His neighbors would laugh at him. But all such objections Noah by faith got over. His obedience was ready and resolute. Having begun to build, he did not leave off till he had finished, so did he, and so must we do. He feared the deluge and therefore prepared the ark. And in the warning given to Noah, there is a more solemn warning given to us to flee from the wrath to come, which will sweep the world of unbelievers into the pit of destruction. Christ, the true Noah, which same shall comfort us, hath by his sufferings already prepared the ark and kindly invites us by faith to enter in. While the day of his patience continues, let us hear and obey his voice. The call to Noah is very kind, like that of a tender father to his children to come indoors when he sees night or a storm coming. Noah did not go into the ark till God bade him, though he knew it was to be his place of refuge. It is very comfortable to see God going before us in every step we take. Noah had taken many pains to build the ark, and now he was himself kept alive in it. What we do in obedience to the command of God and in faith, we ourselves shall certainly have the comfort of, first or last. This call to Noah reminds us of the call the gospel gives to poor sinners. Christ is an ark in whom alone we can be safe when death and judgment approach. Noah was accounted righteous, not for his own righteousness, but as an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. He believed the revelation of a Savior and sought and expected salvation through Him alone. Thus was He justified by faith and received that Spirit whose fruit is in all goodness. But if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, 
he is none of his. After the hundred and twenty years, God granted seven days longer space for repentance. But these seven days were trifled away, like all the rest. It shall be but seven days. They had only one week more, one Sabbath more, to improve and to consider the things that belong to their peace. But it is common for those who have been careless of their souls during the years of their health, when they have looked upon death at a distance, to be as careless during the days, the few days of their sickness, when they see death approaching, their hearts being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. As Noah prepared the ark by faith in the warning given that the flood would come, so he went into it, by faith in this warning that it would come quickly. And on the day Noah was securely fixed in the ark, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. The earth had within it those waters which at God's command sprang up and flooded it. And thus our bodies have in themselves those humors which, when God pleases, become the seeds and springs of mortal diseases. The windows of heaven were opened, and the waters which were above the firmament, that is, in the air, were poured out upon the earth. The rain comes down in drops, but such rains fell then as were never known before or since. It rained without stop or abatement, forty days and forty nights, upon the whole earth at once. As there was a peculiar exercise of the almighty power of God in causing the flood, it is vain and presumptuous to attempt explaining the method of it by human wisdom. The ravenous creatures were made mild and manageable, yet when this occasion was over they were of the same kind as before, for the ark did not alter their natures. Hypocrites in the church, who outwardly conform to the laws of that ark, are yet unchanged, and it will appear one time or other what kind they are after. God continued his care of Noah. God shut the door to secure him and keep him safe in the ark, also to keep all others forever out. In what manner this was done, God has not been pleased to make known. There is much of our gospel duty and privilege to be seen in Noah's safety in the ark. Observe then, it is our great duty, in obedience to the gospel call, by a lively faith in Christ, to come into that way of salvation which God has provided for poor sinners. Those that come into the ark should bring as many as they can with them, by good instructions, by persuasions, and by good examples. There is room enough in Christ for all comers. God put Adam into paradise, but did not shut him in, so he threw himself out. But when God put Noah into the ark, and so when he brings a soul to Christ, the salvation is sure. It is not in our own keeping, but in the Mediator's hand. But the door of mercy will shortly be shut against those that now make light of it. Knock now, and it shall be opened. The flood was increasing for forty days. The waters rose so high that the tops of the highest mountains overflowed more than twenty feet. There is no place on earth so high as to set men out of the reach of God's judgments. God's hand will find out all his enemies. When the flood thus increased, Noah's ark was lifted up, and the waters which broke down everything else bore up the ark, that which to unbelievers betokens death unto death, to the faithful betokens life unto life. All the men, women, and children that were in the world except those in the ark died. We may easily imagine what terror seized them. Our Savior tells us that till the very day that the flood came, they were eating and drinking. They were deaf and blind to all divine warnings. In this posture, death surprised them. They were convinced of their folly when it was too late. We may suppose they tried all ways and means possible to save themselves, but all in vain. And those that are not found in Christ, the ark, are certainly undone, undone forever. Let us pause and consider this tremendous judgment. Who can stand before the Lord when he is angry? The sin of sinners will be their ruin, first or last, if not repented of. The righteous God knows how to bring ruin upon the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
happy they who are part of Christ's family and safe with him as such. They may look forward without dismay and rejoice that they shall triumph when fire shall burn up the earth and all that therein is. We are apt to suppose some favorable distinctions in our own case or character, but if we neglect, refuse, or abuse the salvation of Christ, we shall, notwithstanding such fancied advantages, be destroyed in the common ruin of an unbelieving world. Significance of Noah's Ark Dr. Ray Pritchard compared the flood to the second coming, because for the unbelievers who scoff at Christians, it will be business as usual until the very day Jesus returns. On that day, as it was when Noah sealed the doors of the ark against late comers, it would be too late. Just as God didn't prepare two arks, he doesn't have two plans of salvation. Noah foreshadows the Messiah in this sense. He had to remain faithful for a long time. Scripture is not specific about how long it took him and his sons to build the ark but it was a massive undertaking. Since they were the only men God would save, were they the only men involved in building the ark? If so, then the project would have taken even longer than with a team of boat builders on board. We don't know if Noah had ever sailed. If he knew how to build even a small structure, this might have been the first time he picked up the tools for such a job. Christians know what it's like to wait for God to give a yes to prayer and they understand what it's like to wait for the real Savior to return. Noah and his sons needed patience to complete their work. They had to toil under the constant scrutiny and, perhaps, the laughter of those who would pass them in their labors and shake their heads, express disbelief, or openly ridicule them. Jesus and his disciples were also mocked, rejected, and threatened with physical violence up until the end of Christ's mortal life, when those threats were realized. They could relate to Noah, the outsider, and a laughingstock. It is important to remember that the significance of Noah's Ark lies not only in its physical existence, but also in its symbolic importance as a testament to God's faithfulness, provision, and salvation. Rather than focusing solely on the physical whereabouts of the Ark, we are encouraged to reflect on the spiritual lessons and messages conveyed in Genesis. The story of Noah's Ark prompts us to consider themes of obedience, trust, redemption, and the promise of new beginnings. Have you ever wondered about the symbols of the dove, olive branch, and rainbow? God directed and Noah obeyed, built the Ark, loaded up, closed the doors, and water rose around him. All land disappeared. He waited for about a year from the first rainfall until a dove brought him an olive branch, the sign that land had reemerged. During this time God might have spoken again, but no mention is made of it. Noah must have begun to wonder whether God had forgotten him, his family, and the animals as they floated like insignificant bits of refuse on the great tide. Most believers know that feeling. At first, God seems to provide direction through Scripture, prayer, even advertisements on billboards and songs on the radio. They are signs that a door is opening or closing. What a relief to receive such clear direction. While one might feel abandoned or worthless during the long, long wait for step two, God does not forget his children. God had never actually forgotten Noah, for God never forgets anything. Scripture portrays God as forgetting and remembering in order to make him accessible and familiar. If you think yourself to be abandoned by God, the hope is in knowing that God will act again. And in the meantime, your job is to go on in faithful obedience to what he has already shown you, however long ago that may have been, for it is God's nature to remember. He is faithful. Later, when Noah's ordeal was over, he and his shipmates had disembarked. Noah remembered God. He showed it by building an altar and then sacrificing some of all the clean animals and clean birds as sin offerings. Although we forget God's goodness immediately after we have been delivered from some distressing situation, Noah did not forget. What example has Noah set for the Christian living thousands of years after the Great Flood? 
we pick up our crosses and follow Christ, making a sacrifice of joy and gratitude. Our desires for His desires. Our sacrifice is not duty or legalism. The Lord wants mercy, not sacrifice and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. We want signs, like the dove carrying an olive branch, but Christ's death and resurrection were our sign of His love and faithfulness. Meanwhile, the Lord desires a sign from us, His children, patience, which demonstrates our trust in Him, thankfulness, which honors and glorifies the Lord. Noah knew God's loving, omnipotent character before he closed the ark door and shut out all latecomers who had ignored the evidence of God's glory. He knew he could trust God. We also have evidence of God's goodness, His kindness, His power, His faithfulness. God's character is reflected in Jesus Christ. All we need to do now is to remember. Well, that's all about today's video. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. Remember to turn on the notification bell to watch the latest videos from us. See you in the next videos. Goodbye.